Welcome to our special program dedicated to the situation in Libya. Flooding brought by Storm Daniel has pushed a divided nation to the limit with alarming levels of death and destruction. Let's show you some of the images from the scene. They really do tell the story. The death toll in Libya is now estimated at more than 2,300. This is the Red Crescent going public with this figure and adding that as many as 10,000 people are unaccounted for. In reality, the total killed by the floods will be far higher because the area affected has a transit population uh, that isn't documented. Basically, migrants traveling through hoping to reach Europe. The coast of Libya has been battered by Storm Daniel. Derna has been underwater, the storm there causing two dams to burst. Musa al Maj and Benghazi all badly flooded too. Well, join us to discuss the situation we have here in the studio. Our environment uh, commentator, Valerie de Kim. Valerie, thank you for being with us. We have uh, joining us by Skype from Washington, D.C., uh, Frederick Vere, who's a senior fellow at the Middle East Program at, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Frederick, thank you for joining us. And joining us by phone from Tripoli in Libya, Gumar El Gamati, who, who's head of the Tagir Party. He'll be giving us an insight as to what is happening on the ground there in Libya. Gumar, thank you for being with us. First, let's thank get you. a roundup of the situation. Here at France 24, Charlie James with this. One quarter of the city of Derna completely washed away. Thousands of residents killed when dams outside the city collapsed, unleashing a wall of water. Witnesses say it erased everything in its path. Dams collapsed around Wadi Derna and caused water to cascade into the city itself. Three bridges collapsed completely and water spread inside the neighborhoods, and there are entire neighborhoods that move to the sea. The destruction caused by Mediterranean storm Daniel. After devastating parts of Greece, Bulgaria and Turkey, Daniel pounded eastern Libya's coast Sunday night. I saw a man carried away by water who just passed my house. I don't know if he's hanging onto that car or if he's gone far away. A state of emergency has been announced, but it's slow and arduous work for rescue teams still waiting for the flooding to recede. Emergency crews have uncovered hundreds of bodies and several aid workers have died. But the rival politics of post-war Libya makes this challenge even more difficult. The eastern Libyan regime, backed by Russia, is not internationally recognized. And its public service and hospital system have been weakened by years of conflict. These are hard and painful times. The number of affected people is very big. The damage is huge. It's hard to describe or measure it. The Tripoli-based National Unity Government says it will send all assistance possible to the east and has requested international help. Italy, Egypt and Turkey among the nations already answering that call, sending aid and rescue teams. Tragic situation. Let's go straight to Tripoli, where Guma El Gamati, head of the Tagia party, <coughs> is waiting for us. Uh, Guma, thanks for joining us in these circumstances. Uh, sympathies uh, to yourself, to your people. Um, what is your take on what is going on? What is your sense of what is happening right now? Okay, and you'll tell me how to get back well, on. thank you for having me on. Um, the news are still coming through of the magnitude of the disaster, the catastrophe, especially in Darna. I mean, Daniel hit the east of Libya from Benghazi all the way to Darna, but Darna uh, brought, you know, the biggest, the biggest effect and the biggest damage is in Darna. We are talking about an entire district in the center of the city have been swept away by heavy water coming down from the one mountain when two dams literally busted and, and, and unprecedented amounts of water and rain just came down and swept the entire buildings, four, five, six-story buildings, entire houses just swept away into the sea. So uh, thousands and thousands of people are still missing. Those who have been collected and buried in mass graves in an area called Martuba, east of Darna, are already nearly a thousand, which means that probably thousands and thousands more bodies have not been collected or picked up or, 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 or even are in the sea. So the magnitude is absolutely huge. It is a catastrophe. It's unprecedented. Libya have, has never 
have never seen anything like this, and the country is simply not equipped to deal with this disaster. It doesn't matter about the political divide, because this challenge, this humanitarian disaster, transcends all political polarization and all political divisions. All Libyans are coming together. Everybody is doing their part. Everybody is contributing. Mobilizations have been from all over the country, from the West, from the East, from the South, from all authorities, whether it's the government in the East or the government in Tripoli, all municipalities, all civil uh, uh, defense authorities have been mobilized, but we are simply not equipped to deal with the magnitude of the disaster. We, ha we badly and urgently need international support and international intervention. We need sophisticated equipment. We need equipment to, to, uh, to collect people or identify people under, under the rubble, under buildings, and collect bodies. We need equipment to restore power and electricity, which is completely out in Darna. We need equipment to restore communication, telecommunication and internet, so that people inside who are trapped can communicate with their relatives. We need temporary uh, roads and temporary bridges. So the magnitude is huge. The, the amount of uh, uh, help is needed is also uh, huge. And uh, unfortunately, uh, people are stuck, are trapped. This city is about 180,000 population. So you can imagine when the whole heart of the city, the city center, a huge residential area will probably 20 or 30,000 population have been uh, completely overrun by, by water. You can, you can imagine the catastrophe and the level of the damage. So I hope the international community will come and come fast because it's badly needed. The international community listening to this uh, broadcast, Guma, and, and the way you've described it is incredibly vivid and it is incredibly moving. And one can only imagine the, the extent of the suffering in the place that you've just described. You understand at uh, Adena, uh, two dams bursting under the, the, the weight and the, 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 the intensity of Storm Daniel. Do you have anything more to tell us about that? Yes, because the geography of Darna is, Darna is an enclave where uh, there is between a mountain and the sea. So the mountain is to the south and the sea to the north. And there is a, a little valley, a little, literally a little river, which runs from the top of the mountain south of the city all the way down to the sea. It splits the city into two halves. This, this little uh, uh, va valley or, or, or river, normally uh, they have two dams one at the top and one in the middle. Those dams were built 40 years ago. And, and normally there is never this level of rain and water. You see, the rainfall in the last few days has never been witnessed in Libya. So that is why <laughs> normally the dams will cope with the amount of rain and the, and the water will just trickle down through the, through the little valley and then just go to the sea. But this time the dams completely busted. The amount of water that came down completely took away three bridges and just overran the whole district area of the center of the city. So it, 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 it's, it's unbelievable. Never, never, never seen. You only see it in movies. So that is why it's horrific. And people, unfortunately, it happened like three, four o'clock in the morning. So people were asleep. People were not warned. People were not told to evacuate hours before. There should have been alarming. There should have been warning signals there. There should have been warnings from the authorities for people to evacuate and move away from this area. We hear, we hear reports that the the, munis the municipality, the mayor of Darna, recommended that all those people in the center should be evacuated hours and hours before the, the dam busted. But some other uh, superior military force in the east told them no, nobody moves of there. This, this story needs to be verified, but this is what we read today and what we hear. So I think there should be, when everything is, is, is calmed down, we need an investigation of exactly what happened and why uh, a mass evacuation was not carried out hours and hours before the, the, the Daniel hit Darna and before this level of waterfall and, and rain and water levels hit the city. But that's yet to be established. But as now, all we think about is those who perished, those who are dead, those who are under the ripple, those who are in the, floating in the sea, and that the city is completely cut off, no power, no, no electricity, no communication, no internet, no hospitals, 
no medical supplies, no food, no shelter, and it's very difficult to get into this city because you only get to this city from three roads, one from the east, one from the west, and one from the south through the mountain. And I think all three roads are now cut off, and it's impossible to get in by cars. That's why we need temporary roads and temporary bridges. It's a, it's a huge engineering uh, uh, operation, but I'm sure international uh, communities have those facilities and those means to give this kind of logistical support. Kuma El Gamati, head of the Libyan Tagia Party, talking to us from Tripoli. Thank you so very much indeed for giving us uh, what is a really disturbing and detailed uh, account uh, of what has happened uh, in that uh, part uh, of Libya and the scale, of course, as Guma is saying, is something we're still trying to come to terms with. Our next guest, uh, Dax Bennett Rock, who's country director for the for Libya at the Norwegian Refugee Council. Thanks for joining us, sir. We heard from Guma El Gamati that international aid and help is needed. Can I just ask you to take it up from there? What can you offer? What's on the way? Exactly. I think uh, your guest, uh, Ustaz Gumal, has accurately sort of painted a dire picture in Libya and the impact this storm has had, not only in the east, but across Libya. I think my main message to the international community is to mobilize funding as soon as possible. As Mr. Gumal has highlighted, there are needs concerning infrastructure, damage homes, damage uh, water stations, damaged dams. But more importantly, you have thousands of people who have passed away, who have lost everything that they have worked for to build. And these uh, communities, especially those impacted in Adirna, need emergency assistance. They need access to shelter, safe shelter. They need access to food, drinking water. They need access to basic essentials. And more importantly, you have thousands of young people and children who have also been impacted by this severe storm, who are going through very, very difficult physical and mental situation. So we need teams that can provide psychosocial support to these young people. So I urge the international community to mobilize resources for the Libya response, for local actors on the ground, for international organizations as well, given that Libya has been a uh, crisis that has been underfunded for some time now. Uh, given the situation, Dax, in terms of the, the number of people affected here, I mean, obviously the death toll is one thing, but there are lots of people who are still there uh, in need of all the things that have been destroyed. And obviously the issue of secondary infection following the disaster is, is a big threat now too, isn't it? Uh, correct. That's why, again, the urge for mobilizing resources to ensure that people can have access to safe hygiene, safe wash facilities, and then more importantly, safe access to shelter as well, given that the damage specifically in Derna, but also in Benghazi and Shahat and al Beida, has been quite impactful for the affected communities. Uh, large neighborhoods, residential buildings have been completely destroyed. So emergency funding is needed to make sure that people have a safe place uh, to live, to reside, as they're able to recover over the next couple of months and years to get back their, their uh, normalcy. Indeed. And what can, what can be done for those people who are currently, I suppose the term refugee might come into question, but obviously a refugee is someone going from one place to another. At times, these people are stuck. I mean, getting help to them is going to be a major problem. Uh, correct. Um, refugees and migrants are at increased risk in Libya. But again, this storm has affected large parts of the country. It hit, has impacted communities, both Libyan communities and migrant refugee communities. Um, so I think the best strategy for it is to make sure that funding is mobilized quickly, that it arrives uh, to local actors, to international organizations, so they can provide both life-saving assistance to refugees and migrants and also to uh, Libyans as well. Dax Bennett Rock from the uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, country director for Libya. Thank you, sir, for sharing uh, your analysis of the situation and your take. Much appreciated here in France 24. Thank you very much indeed. That issue about thank international you. aid, thank you again, sir, for joining us. That issue of international aid, of course, is paramount. Uh, let's bring in Jasper Mortimer, our correspondent in Ankara, uh, Turkey. Jasper, we understand uh, Turkey already lining up uh, some kind of humanitarian aid program uh, coming from Ankara to uh, Libya. What more can you tell us? Yes, this is quite interesting. The first two countries to provide aid to Libya are two former colonial powers in uh, Libya, uh, Italy and the Turks. Uh, Turkey has flown three 
plane fulls of aid uh, containing various pieces of equipment, you, you know, uh, 20 generators, two rubber dinghies. Uh, I think it's um, uh, 400 food and uh, hy uh, hygiene uh, product packets, 600 blankets, 170 tents. But, most importantly of all, 168 rescue personnel, including divers, who will go under the floodwaters and try and retrieve bodies. Uh, um, and, you know, the rescue personnel are in for a, a tricky situation because three Libyan rescue workers working for the Libyan Red Crescent have already died in this disaster. Um, the interesting thing about the Turkish aid was that it was flown to Benghazi, the capital of eastern Libya. Now, Turkey supports the West Libyan government, uh, yet President Recep Tayyip Erdogan clearly has enough influence with the eastern Libyan authorities that he can land his aid plane on their territory. Jasper, it's, it's especially interesting from a political angle too, isn't it? Because clearly there is a massive job to be done. But clearly, what is this thing about Turkey's stance, do you think? Well, I think Recep Tayyip Erdogan is demonstrating his unusual ability to give military support to one side in a conflict while keeping on good terms with the other side. He's doing this in Ukraine. Uh, Turkey um, provides military drones to the Ukrainians, but Erdogan keeps on good terms with the Russians, as shown by his summit with President Vladimir Putin uh, in Sochi last week. Uh, in the case of Libya, uh, Turkey supplies military equipment and military advisors uh, to the internationally recognized government in Tripoli, West Libya. But Erdogan still clearly hasn't burnt his bridges with the eastern Libyan rebels. Um, domestically, uh, the, the disaster is proving to be politically significant as well. Earlier today, uh, a plane carrying, I think, 14 tons of humanitarian aid took off a, a West Libyan government plane took off from Tripoli and landed in Benghazi. It must be the first time in many years that a West Libyan government plane has landed in Benghazi. Uh, uh, and this shows that uh, these floods, uh, awful and murderous though they are, uh, they are providing an opportunity to bring the two sides of Libya together. Jasper Mortimer for now. Thank you very much indeed. Jasper Mortimer, our correspondent in Ankara. Let's bring in from Washington, D.C., Frederick Wery, who's senior fellow at the Middle East Program of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Frederick, thank you for bearing with us, and I hope you're able to follow uh, what our previous speakers were saying. Uh, can I bring back something that Guma El Gamati was saying? He said of the uh, Tagir party uh, in Libya. He joined us from the, the capital, Tripoli. He was talking about the fact that this is, in a sense, a disaster which is uniting a divided country. Uh, do you see that actually as, as a, a realistic thing? Do you see going forward that this could be the start of a, a broader solution in Libya? Thank you. And yeah, my condolences to the people of Libya and especially the residents of, of Derna. That's my great hope. I mean, again, we've perhaps seen some encouraging signs. We've already seen a lot of the political divisions, um, at least at the elite level, being bridged between the leader of the Western government, uh, Prime Minister Dabeba and, and Khalifa Heftar. There's been a lot of, you know, convergence. And so now you have this, this flight, this exchange of aid. Again, I hope that at the working level in terms of, of relief aid, you know, medicine, food, that we're going to see the country uh, come together. And we certainly um, see signs of that happening. However, comma, will this really result in a change in the way Libya is governed? And I think the great tragedy of the, the scale of the deaths in this flood is that it's really an indictment of how Libya has been governed, right? The corruption, the lack of preparedness, the shoddy construction materials, the fact that these dams, you know, were neglected. Floods are not unique in Libya. There's been flooding in multiple towns, and in many cases, it's a problem of poor urban design. Um, you know, again, so we're talking here about regions and towns that have been neglected 
in part for political reasons. And again, we have to point the finger at the political class of Libya. Why was Derna so exposed? In part because it has a history of problems with the regime, the military regime of General Khalifa Heftar in eastern Libya. And he's kept it on military lockdown. And I think that political dimension has to be brought into the conversation here. Since 2011, of course, and the uh, demise of the dictator Muammar Gaddafi, Libya has been, uh, as you were hinting at there, a divided nation. Often the word lawless is, is used. It's right. that sense of neglect, is it, that has led and really exacerbated this situation? You, you're alluding to the, the dams and how they were poorly maintained. I mean, one would expect a dam would not burst in a storm. Right. Again, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is, uh, well, from what I know about Libya's infrastructure in multiple areas and, you know, talking about drainage, sewage, all sorts of things, th this is a country that, um, you know, even under Gaddafi was, was falling apart. And it's gotten worse under, um, you know, since his demise in terms of what you call lawlessness, the, the rule of predatory militias who are basically after money. I mean, there's a whole story here of environmental devastation, deforestation that leaves the country more exposed to extreme weather events and climate change. The country is not preparing for climate change. It's one of the most exposed countries in the world. Um, again, it's in part because of, I think, you know, longstanding structural factors, but it's also the political choices of the country's um, elites, its, its ruling class. Frederick, can you bear with us, please? Uh, I'll like to try and get back to you for uh, a couple of comments before the end of the program. Thank you very much, Frederick right. Very from the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Let's bring in our um, environment uh, commentator, Valerie de Kimp, here in the studio. Valerie, Storm Daniel. Um, one might not have expected two dams to burst uh, in one place and cause such devastation. One might have expected lots of rain, uh, but not the devastation that's been caused by this flooding. Give us some sense of this storm, Daniel, and its power. Right. So Storm Daniel essentially transformed into what weather experts are now calling a medicane. So it's short for Mediterranean hurricane, uh, a tropical like uh, cyclone occurring occasionally in the Mediterranean Sea. And so let me show you this is what a medicane looks like. And this was over the weekend as it made landfall in Benghazi. So just like a hurricane, um, it the, you know, the clouds swirl around and this uh, eye like Central structure. This is where the, the storm is the strongest. So it is a Medicaid, a Mediterranean hurricane is not as powerful as a hurricane uh, because they are geographically confined to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, surrounded by land. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that it cannot be deadly, as we have seen with uh, flooding, with a uh, heavy, heavy rainfall and strong winds. Now, this uh, Medicaid again began with Storm Daniel. Storm Daniel wreaking havoc in Greece, uh, Turkey, and Bulgaria. And it all started, Storm Daniel, with this, uh, the Omega block, uh, a weather pattern cons consisting of high-pressure uh, regions uh, with uh, high temperatures here in the middle, sandwiched between two regions with low pressure. And this is what uh, created Storm Daniel, again, transforming into this Mediterranean uh, hurricane. And so after it triggered heavy flood in uh, Greece, it then moved uh, towards the south there, uh, Libya, um, and we have this this the, the images here showing you how it it moved and progressed towards Libya. And what we know now is that it has moved towards Egypt. Indeed, that could be the very next destination. Of course, right. people in Egypt starting to batten down the hatches in anticipation of that. Um, so a medi a medicane, a Mediterranean hurricane. Is this something that is? Um, a natural occurring phenomenon, I think that's what you said, is it made worse by climate change? I presume the answer is yes. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the, the really important, uh, you know, thing to mention here is that, of course, a Mediterranean hurricane is a natural phenomenon. But the important point to make is that uh, climate change is exacerbating uh, weather events like this Medicaid. Um, and they're 
also made more likely by human-induced climate change. So it's like Storm Daniel was supercharged, if you will, by the climate crisis. And so investigating the links between climate change and recurrent uh, weather disasters is now a specific scientific uh, discipline called attribution science. And this is something that usually requires a lot of research. But a team of scientists here in Europe, they've come together, they've developed a framework to call Climeter, providing a scientific assessment of, of weather disasters immediately after they happen. And so they've looked at Storm Daniel. This is part of their conclusion, a very uh, simple graphic here. So essentially, Storm Daniel was strengthened by climate change. And it also, it shows you there that it's it, it remains a relatively rare event. Again, uh, storms supercharged by climate change. Another really quick point that I want to make, Mark, that is important is that the Mediterranean has been hit by uh, recurrent marine heat waves, not only this summer, but also last summer with temperatures uh, rising five, six degrees above uh, normal, above average. So sometimes reaching 30 degrees Celsius water temperatures. We're talking about water temperatures even uh, at a depth of like 20, 30 meters. And so this is also adding uh, to storms because storms become more powerful. They get their energy from uh, high uh, water temperatures. And so again, you see how this is all uh, so intertwined with, uh, uh, you know, different uh, concepts consequences, impacts of climate change all coming together and creating uh, even more pow powerful climate uh, disasters. And so this is essentially what we're seeing now in the Mediterranean, a med the Mediterranean being uh, one of the regions in the world, according to IPCC scientists, one of the most vulnerable as well to all the, the different kind of uh, uh, climate disasters that we're talking about. Valerie, thank you. you. You paint a very vivid picture of a vicious circle, which is making things worse uh, by the moment, and uh, clearly uh, this whole concept is something that uh, we all need to be turning our attention to, don't we? Valerie de Kim, thank you very much for joining us. Great to see you. Let's go straight to Cairo. Edouard Cousin is there waiting for us. Edward, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, it seems that the storm is heading towards you next. Are you prepared? Yes, well, um, in terms of preparation, the government here in Egypt has given uh, slightly mixed signals. On Sunday, uh, the, the um, state media headlined, uh, be ready, Storm Daniel is going to hit Egypt on Monday night, so yesterday night. But yesterday, on Monday itself, uh, the same media had a headline saying, no need for panic, because Storm Daniel has lost uh, much of his strength, so it will not be um, so severe here in Egypt. Um, so far, what we've seen in terms of the weather in Egypt is indeed uh, not much reason to panic. Uh, the, the, the weather changed, the weather is unusual. We have seen uh, dust storms, heavy wind, uh, cloudy, um, uh, light rain, which is very unusual for September in, in Cairo, but nothing uh, in terms of extreme weather causing actual damages. Uh, the, the areas most at risk would be the Mediterranean coast and in the north coast of Egypt, uh, with, for instance, a big city of Alexandria. But I've heard from people there also, um, yeah, uh, thick fog, um, strong winds, but nothing disastrous. Only more to the west, towards the border with Libya. Uh, I've seen a lot of videos and heard from people very strong winds there. Uh, Again, unusual. Again, uh, nothing like we've seen in, in Libya. Uh, so, so far, it seems that uh, Egypt is relatively spared. Um, these kind of storms are definitely a concern for Egypt. Eh? You have the northern coast on the Mediterranean and the big cities, and with a low delta, that's very vulnerable for uh, flooding or, uh, or storms that could cause a lot of damage uh, and, um, and injuries. But now, as said, uh, this storm... So far, that seems not to be the case. But are people actually making preparations, Edward? Not that I've seen. Not that I've seen. Okay. Um, people, yeah, people seem to be rather calm about. Of course, on social media, you see people being worried after seeing the footages in, in, in Libya uh, and about some media reports. But... On the street, to be honest, uh, people are living their lives, and, 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 and media were even reporting that 
uh, the coming days there will be some cooler weather, uh, which is, is pleasant compared to a, a huge heat, heat wave that was there last week. So, yeah, very different picture here. Edouard Kusan in Cairo, thank you very much indeed for giving us that snapshot of how Egypt is preparing, or not, for the arrival of this storm, which, according to you, Edward, and we understand its power will have reduced uh, somewhat before it arrives where you are. Edward Kusan, thank you very much indeed. Let's go back to Washington. Frederick, where are you waiting for us there from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, senior fellow uh, Frederick Wary. Frederick, the, the situation, uh, clearly, in terms of sorting out uh, what's happening in Libya. Uh, there is much that needs to be done. W what do you see as the priorities right now? I mean, clearly, getting bodies there to help to sort of get sh supplies into people who desperately need them, getting people in there with expertise uh, to clean up, that's got to be, be the priority, hasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we need the relief effort. We need to get uh, access for humanitarian relief. Uh, that's that's absolutely the first priority. But as was mentioned, I do hope that this creates momentum for some broader political changes, political reconciliation, some changes to the way things are done in Libya. And, and specifically, again, bridging those political divides in Libya between the East and West. But more importantly, you know, local level governance, ensuring that towns like Derna and other areas throughout the country are properly equipped to handle you know, disasters like this and just meet the needs of their citizens. When I travel across Libya, it's, it's very clear to me that this story of neglect, you know, towns not having the right infrastructure, not having enough water, not being prepared for, uh, you know, fires, for things like climate change, that's, that's a recurring story. And so I really hope that the officials in both Tripoli and then in the East and Benghazi are, are going to take away some lessons from this uh, horrible human tragedy. Because the potential of Libya I mean, is huge, isn't it? I mean, it, it could be, uh, in many ways, a, a very prosperous and, and functioning place, could it not, with the right kind of adjustments? Absolutely. The, the country has enormous, uh, you know, potential. Again, obviously, it's, it's oil reserves, um, solar energy. It has enormous potential as a, as a tourism attraction. I mean, the the coastline, actually, of Derna is is one of the most beautiful coastlines in the Mediterranean, and I've had Libyan friends saying it's, you know, it's better than the French Riviera. I mean, we're talking about pristine beaches. There are archaeological ruins along that stretch of eastern Libya that are, you know, world class. And so, again, the the country has enormous historical heritage, enormous uh, cultural and human potential, as you as you mentioned. Frederick Ray for now. Thank you very much indeed, Frederick Ray from the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Let's uh, get more on the... Thank you, sir. Let's get more on this uh, idea of, of the aid getting through. I mean, clearly, uh, as Jasper Mortar was telling us earlier from Ankara, there is a, a Turkish uh, delegation that's been sent with on three aircraft bringing all manner of humanitarian uh, aid that is needed uh, very, very urgently. Uh, clearly, if we heard from Guma El at the beginning of this program, that Libya is overwhelmed. People are really struggling to cope with the scale of what is in front of them. And it has been a devastating uh, sequence of events. Events. Uh, let's take a look then at this uh, humanitarian angle. Jetted in from Turkey, rescue teams and humanitarian aid, including tents, generators, food, hygiene products and clothes. Rescue boats and life vests are unloaded from the United Arab Emirates. Meanwhile, aid sent by other Libyan municipalities arrived at Al Abraq airport, bound for the nearby eastern coastal towns hit by flash flooding in particular Derna, where dams broke and entire neighborhoods were washed away. Derna is facing an absolute crisis. Mehili has been completely cut off. Yesterday we left at 4 a.m. driving around 350 kilometers to reach it. It's a disastrous situation. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi pledged military equipment and personnel, while the U.S., Iran, Italy and Qatar are among other countries to promise aid. Libya is already straining for more than a decade of conflict. And aid organization must be coordinated between the country's two governments. The prime minister of the government in eastern Libya said the devastation in Derna is far beyond the capabilities of his country. 
a sentiment echoed by the IFRC. Humanitarian needs are huge and much more uh, beyond the uh, abilities of the Libyan Red Crescent and even beyond the abilities of the, of the government. The challenges are ranging between uh, access to basic health uh, facilities or health services, uh, shelter uh, and shelter management, uh, food and non-food items, uh, first aid, like social support and restoring family lives. A World Health Organization spokesperson described a calamity of epic proportions while the UN's Organization for Migration expressed concern for the many vulnerable migrants in the country. Catherine Akeda Clifford with that report. Uh, joining us uh, here uh, for the uh, final moments of, of our special program on the situation in Libya, we have our environmental commentator, Valerie de Kim, and joining us from Washington, Frederick Wehry from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Valerie, can I come to you? And just raise the issue we, we were speaking about earlier, you and I, um, this, this whole thing about the injustice that climate change is produced by the, the rich industrialized nations. And it's Africa that produces so little of these climate change issues, gases. You can make the whole list. That is the worst affected. And here, you know, Libya, there in North Africa, going through this remarkable, horrendous devastation caused by a natural disaster made all the worse by climate change. But clearly, this is yet another example of the injustice of the climate crisis. Uh, Libya is responsible for 0.2 percent of global emissions. So they contribute so little to the climate crisis, and yet they will pay such a heavy price for the storm, not just economically, of course, we've seen the devastation, the destruction, but livelihoods, uh, lives, and just the, the growth potential uh, you were talking about there, Mark. So uh, G20 countries, on the other hand, meeting in India just this weekend, they are responsible for 78 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we've heard of, uh, you know, countries, Turkey, for example, providing aid, bringing aid to Libya. In the long term, though, uh, those countries, G20 countries, uh, industrialized nations are not the ones uh, finding themselves in heavy debt as a result of recurrent uh, climate disasters. Uh, in order to respond to the crisis, again, lost growth potential, because these extreme weather events will get uh, more and more uh, intense and more frequent as well. So I would not be surprised if, you know, the events in Libya become some form of, of rallying cry for developing nations heading into uh, COP28, the UN Climate Summit in Dubai later this year, with developing nations demanding that wealthy nations really uh, do their part in terms of uh, ambition, raising ambition, uh, reducing, uh, further reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, but of course, more importantly, in terms of finance, uh, what exactly are they bringing to the table for uh, well developing nations like Libya to respond to, you know, devastating events like what we've seen so far? Uh, you know, we, we've over the years we've had um, wealthy nations they've had this promise of providing 100 billion U.S. dollars every single year. That target has never been met. Um, and I would also not be surprised if, you know, the events in Libya become another tragic example uh, that developing nations will use to say this is exactly why we need a loss and damage mechanism, a funding mechanism that have been, they've been demanding and calling for for years that will help uh, poor nations really respond to weather events that they cannot adapt to. Uh, this is not something they can prepare for. Valerie, thank you very much indeed. Let's turn now to uh, Frederick uh, Very from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Frederick, we were speaking about the, the issues uh, earlier about uh, climate change. You mentioned deforestation, the particular problem that that would have, uh, how that would have added to what has happened. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have any thoughts on what happens next, because clearly at some point people will come to terms with what has happened, with the devastation. Um, those who've lost their lives hopefully will have some kind of, of, of proper burial, some kind of laying to rest. But then the reconstruction starts. How does that mm -hmm. begin? Well, that's a big question mark, in part because of the political issues I mentioned in eastern Libya with the way General Heftar has, has viewed this town and the problems. And so, again, the, the purely technical issues, as was mentioned by um, your guest from Tripoli about, you know, getting access, that's compounded by all these 
you know, political factors. And so, of course, there needs to be reconstruction for that town. But I do want to address the broader issue of what next in terms of, of climate change. You know, Libya is, um, I don't know if I would call it a developing or poor nation. It's an incredibly rich nation with, with oil. And it actually has one of the highest per capita carbon emission rates in the world that is on par with industrial countries in, in Europe and Asia. And so it's a gas, oil producing country. So the problem is not the absence of money. It's how that money is used. And I was in Libya this summer looking at climate change. And the problem is the government has been totally paralyzed, you know, totally incapacitated, is totally ignorant of moving forward on climate change. It's one of the least prepared uh, countries in the world for climate change. Of all the signatories of the Paris Accord, it is this, the only one that has not submitted a roadmap um, for, for climate adaptation. And so, again, circling back to the political will of Libya's ruling class, they need to learn from this horrible tragedy and change the way they're doing uh, business, you know, not just on uh, climate change, but again, as I've mentioned, on meeting the needs of, of the people. And this is about the legacy of a civil war. Is that essentially what you're saying? Correct. Again, over a decade of, of civil war, we certainly have to factor in the international uh, dimension here. There have been countries that have been fueling the, the, the conflict, sending in arms, backing uh, factions, to include the countries that are helping right now. Again, Turkey, Egypt, the UAE. Of course, the United States and Europe um, bear a large degree of the blame for the intervention in 2011 and the aftermath. But we also have to pin the, the blame on this dictator that ruled Gaddafi for over 40 years, Muammar Gaddafi, who you were seeing the, the infrastructural rot right now in Libya in, in towns like Derna. Derna was historically neglected by Gaddafi, again, for political reasons. So we're going to be living with this legacy, you know, for a long time. It's going to be difficult to overcome, but Libya's elites need to act now. It's going to be quite a leap is what I'm hearing from you, to get right. Libya to move from where it was under Gaddafi to where it is now, to where it needs to be. Uh, correct. But again, not to not to be nostalgic, but even under Gaddafi, it was, it was not that great. I mean, I was in Tripoli under Gaddafi, and you had massive problems with flooding in the capital, right? I mean, poorly constructed cities. Again, this comes down to, in part, you know, corruption, just poor urban planning. And so, again, the, the, the problem is, is momentous. It goes back to Gaddafi. And as you said, it's going to take some quite, uh, quite a long time to overcome. Frederick, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this special program dedicated to the situation in Libya. That's Frederick Very, Senior Fellow in the Middle East Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, thank you to Guma El Gamati from the Tagia Party. Thank you to our correspondents in Ankara. Uh, that's Jasper Mortimer and in Cairo, Edouard Cousin. Uh, and thank you uh, to, here in the studio, our environmental commentator, Valerie de Kim. Thank you for that essential uh, briefing on what is Storm Daniel, why it's happened, and why it's had such a devastating effect uh, on Libya. We, of course, will continue here at France 24 uh, to bring you uh, up to date with all developments on the situation uh, across the country and, of course, with the further uh, transit of uh, Storm Daniel across the North African coast. Do stay with us.